just who is that rider on the pale horse, which is the fourth horseman of the book of Revelation. This is part 32 of the Revelation study. Okay, we've been working through Revelation. It's highly symbolic. We're commanded of Scripture to compare spiritual with spiritual. Jesus' words, the Word of God, is spirit, John 6, 63. And we do that by, by precept upon precept, line upon line, a little bit here, a little bit there, as Isaiah 28 tells us. We, we go through the Bible. We find all the related verses. And, 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 and we, we trust God that his word is true, and we come to biblical truth. We're working right now on the first of the seven views of the church age, great tribulation, and the last day through the book of Revelation. Revelation 6 and 7 is the first view. It involves the first six seals, the 144,000, and the great multitude from the great tribulation. So we're looking at that right now. Please consider subscribing to this channel. There's a little red button in the bottom right-hand corner. And let's move on with our study. Okay, and the pale horse is the fourth. We've already looked at the white horse, which is Jesus Christ coming with salvation. The red horse is Satan's attempt to stop the gospel. It's spiritual warfare. The black horse, the resultant is that few are saved in this world. It's the, it's the remnant um, and the famine of the word of God, of truth that goes through the world because without the Holy Spirit, we really can't understand the Word of God. So we're going to look at the pale horse, and we're going to see that this pale horse persecutes by sword, famine, death, and beasts of the earth. It's very similar to other passages in the Bible that talk about the Great Tribulation. So we're going to look at this, and let's move forward. Okay, and as we did with the other three beasts, we have the beast, the fourth beast, that says, come and see. And it reminds us that only Christians come to the Father, because the Father draws them. No man can come to the Father uh, except, except they're drawn by God and the Holy Spirit, and they're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We receive the faith of Christ as a gift, and then we exercise saving faith because it's a gift of God. Matthew 13, we, we as Christians can see and we can hear. We can spiritually see. So when we come and see, it's, it's a word to Christians to come to the word of God and understand. Okay, so here's the rider on the pale horse, Revelation 6, 8. I looked and behold a pale horse. And that literally is a greenish yellow color. And his name that sat on him was Death. And hell, actually Hades, followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth, the fourth part of the earth, to kill with sword, hunger, which is famine, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. So we're going to look at all these pieces, except the, the sword, the hunger, the death, and the beasts, these four judgments. We're going to get that in the next video, part 33, because we're just not going to have time to do it in this video. But uh, please consider subscribing so you don't miss any of these videos. So right now we're in part 32, and we're going to look at the pale horse. Okay, so first we've seen many times already that the horse is a symbol of warfare, and we've already talked about that. Proverbs 21, 31 is an example. That word pale in the Greek, it's, it's a greenish yellow color. Um, it's the color of grass. When that word is used in the New Testament, it's only used four times, the word chloros. And it always, the, the other three occurrences always refer to green grass. So we realize that this has to do with, that this color has to do with what we see in, in the grass. And the grass is like a lightish green, you know, yellowish green type of color. And it reminds us of the brevity of life on earth. Because grass is a symbol of man's brevity or man's shortness on this earth. And we've only got a short time to live on this earth. And that's why this death horse... Uh, is is after us, if as you will. Isaiah 40, the voice said, cry, and he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is the flower of the field. The grass wither, the flower fades, because the spirit of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. So the word of God is forever, but we're just here a very, very short time Sometimes we think life is long. It really is not. We, we only have a short time here. And when we see that grass in the Bible, it, it's quick. It comes up quick. It lasts a while, looks good, and then it fades away. And this, this metaphor about the grass is used in many other places in the Bible referring to the same thing. Uh, so let's move on in this study. 
Let's move on by looking at the name of this horseman. His name is Death. And when we look at names, names represent truth about the person, place, or thing being named. For example, Abram's name was changed from Abram to Abraham, and it had a meaning to that. His name was changed for a meaning. God changed his name to be the father of the multitude. Um, but so when we look at a name, the name death, we see that death is ultimately connected to sin. Uh, in the Garden of Eden, Adam sinned. He, they, uh, Eve was tempted, and they, 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 mankind had fallen in the Garden of Eden. Uh, Romans 5.12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And we see that that's where death occurred. Death started there. For the wages of sin is death. That's what, that's what sin results in, is death. And we see that the devil, the serpent, was in the Garden of Eden. And Jesus Christ, in Hebrews 2.14, uh, we see here, for as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, Jesus Christ, also himself took part of the same. But he didn't sin. He was sinless. That through death, though, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. The serpent came for, to, for death, to make mankind die. So we see um, that the name of this horseman is death. So we see this horseman is closely related to the sin that causes death. But we also see that Hades followed him. Hades would followed with death. And that's exactly what we see in life. Hades, or for the unsaved people, Hades, which is the, pl the intermediate place waiting until Judgment Day, a place of darkness. And we have a video that I'll, I'll post if you want to look at that in more detail. But, but Hades follows death. Death is an action that Hades is that abode of the unsaved dead. And, and these result from sin. O death, where is thy sting? 1 Corinthians 15. O grave, and that word grave is the Greek word Hades, which is the same word as hell. O death, where is thy sting? O Hades or hell, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. And the str strength of sin is the law. The more the law came in, the more people sinned. And we so we see that Hades in the New Testament, which is the same as Sheol in the Old Testament, it's used a lot in the Old Testament, especially. It's pl the place where the unsaved abide until Judgment Day. But we see that Hades, hell, w shall not prevail. This horseman comes with the four judgments of sword, famine, death, and, and the beasts of the earth to attack during the Great Tribulation. But there's no prevailing. We see Jesus Christ has the keys of hell and death, Revelation 1.18, because he was alive and he was dead, and behold, he's alive forevermore. Uh, Matthew 16.18, the gates of hell shall not prevail against God's true people, the true invisible church of God. And we see that ultimately on Judgment Day, the last day, death and Hades, or hell, will be cast into the lake of fire because that intermediate place is no longer needed. There'll be a final Judgment Day. Okay, so the pale horse, though, we have strong evidence that it represents the period of time known as the Great Tribulation. And, and for various reasons. First, and we're going to look at this in more detail, this pale horse has the power over the fourth, the fourth part of the earth. What does that mean? We're going to look at that. Also, these four, uh, the sword, the famine, death, and beast of the earth, they're very similar to what's in other prophetic passages in the Bible, including the Olivet Discourse and Ezekiel 14, the, the whole uh, destruction of Jerusalem and Judah, all the type of the Great Tribulation. So these things come up a lot in the Bible. We might not be familiar with them, but in the Old Testament, these concepts about the famine, the sword, the death, and, and the beasts of the earth shows up many places. And we're going to see in the fifth seal which is right after the fourth seal, that the, there's martyrs that are talked about, and they had just have a little season to wait. So we know that, that these martyrs are coming out of the pale horse, horse affliction, and they just have a little season to wait before Christ returns. So all, for all these reasons, we know that the pale horse is a symbol of what happens in the Great Tribulation. 
Okay, so it's important to understand the fourth part of the earth in this passage. And, and the literal meaning of that is actually the fourth of the land. The definite article, the, is really there. It's in the Greek. Often in the, uh, the translator sometimes add definite articles like the, but this one is actually in the Greek language. So we have to respect that. The fourth, now the word part is not there, and it's the fourth of the land. This earth really, it means land. So the fourth of the land, the number four, and we've studied this before, it's symbolic for universal extent. For example, the four points of the compass, north, south, east, and west, you know, that's, that's God's definition. God, God has created those four points. It could have been six, it could have been eight, it could have been nine, but, but it's, it's four points to the compass, four corners of the land too. So let's move on and look at what the land symbolically means. And when we look at land, it's the Greek word G, G-E, which, which has been used many, many, many times. It usually refers to land, a farmer's land, or a, a land for a country or whatever. But it has a symbolic meaning. And we, we look through the Bible, both Hebrew and Greek, and we see that Adam and Eve was driven out of the garden due to sin. And there's always a need for the promised land. It's a promised people, but there's also a promised land. Where are they going to dwell? And this promise carried all the way through from Genesis to Revelation. And its ultimate fulfillment, though, is eternal life, salvation in the new heavens and the new earth, the new land. And that's where New Jerusalem will be. Hebrews 11:16. This is talking about the faithful, the faithful saints of the Old Testament. Now they desire a better country. That's the word G or land, a better country. That is a heavenly one. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. All these people knew that this earth was not where the, the, the goal was. It's a heavenly city. It's a heavenly land that we look for. Uh, note Revelation 21. This is the ultimate fulfillment of eternity. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. A new land is that same Greek word. For the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. That's not our hope isn't in this world. There's no more sea. I, John saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. The promise is the new heaven, the new earth, which is a new land, that we as Christians dwell as God's people in a new city. So let's go back to our passage and look a little bit at what is the fourth part of land. And when we do that, there's one very prominent passage that helps us unlock the meaning of the fourth of the land, and that's the power of the sower and the seed, also known as the parable of the sower and the four soils. Matthew 13, Mark 4, Luke 8. There's four soil, soils that the seed, the Word of God, falls on. The pathways are those just who don't understand, people that are unsaved, stony, people that kind of get it, but they fall away due to persecution, thorny, People get it, kind of get it, but they fall away due to worldliness. All pictures of people that are not saved. But it's that fourth land. It's that fourth part of the land, the good soil, which is the hearts of God's people. It's, it's where, it's, it, this is, it, the fourth of the land is directed at the hearts or directed toward God's people, Christians. Note Matthew 13, 23, he that receives the seed in the, to the good ground. That ground, of course, is the word land, G. Is, and it's the fourth. It's the fourth ground. He is he that hears the word and understands it, which also bears fruit and brings forth some 160 and 30. These are Christians. The fourth part of the land are Christians. So we can conclude pretty confidently that the fourth of the land is where God dwells in Christians' heart. It's it's the the, the wrath of this pale horse. The anger, the death in Hades is directed toward Christians, although they, this fourth horseman will not prevail. Okay, just a quick summary. The pale horseman, uh, the, the pale is the greenish yellow, which reminds us of, of death, the man's brevity on this earth. And in that brief time, we have an attack. We had an attack by Satan and his ministers. But, but, but in, during the time of the Great Tribulation, that'll be very much intensified. There'll be a great persecution of God's people. But death and Hades will not prevail, will not prevail against pe God's people. And we see that this attack is on the fourth, 
the fourth of the land, and we saw that that represents the good ground or the good land of God's people. Next video, part 33, the pale horseman's four methods of killing. It's the great tribulation. Please consider subscribing, and thank you very much for watching this video.